because really for the next several centuries, all the way through the Reformation, the question of grace, free will, works, faith, um, predestination, and so on, become major issues that separate Catholics from Protestants, that separate one Protestant sect from another. There are a variety of solutions that are proposed. It's an important set of arguments and issues. Moreover, Anselm is an important figure in this, in a sense because he already developed some of the key ideas used in the debate, not only setting up a problem in a particularly true format, but also developing a number of alternative solutions. Uh, and one of the things he nicely brings out is that, in a sense, it's not a problem that requires just one solution. We talk about various ways in which the problem develops and then forms that solutions might take, but you don't have to just pick one. I find myself, in fact, often thinking, well, there's something, yeah, that's my solution. Then I read another one, oh, well, that's my solution, too. And that's really what Anselm does. He says, well, actually, there are a number of things wrong with the argument. And so he lays out a number of different paths to a solution, each one of which all by itself might be enough to, to solve the problem. But he throws out at least three of these, it seems to me. And so before we get into the details of what he says, well, maybe actually I should jump directly in to see how he formulates the problem. The difficulty is the compatibility of God's foreknowledge, predestination, and grace with human freedom. So the question is really something like this. How is it possible for us to act freely if God is omniscient? If God is omniscient, God knows everything that we're going to do. But wait a minute, if God already knows everything I'm going to do, then surely it must be that it's already determined what I'm going to do, in which case I'm not really exercising free will. Now that's to put it in a nutshell, to lay out the argument much more carefully, but that's the basic idea. He begins his work by saying this. It certainly seems as though divine foreknowledge is incompatible with there being human free choice. For what God foreknows shall necessarily come to be in the future, while the things brought about by free choice do not issue from any necessity. And if divine foreknowledge and human free choice cannot both exist, it is impossible for God's foreknowledge, which foresees all things, to coexist with something happening through free choice. <laughs> Yet if it can be shown that the impossibility here is apparent rather than real, the seeming opposition between God's knowledge and human freedom will be shown to be unreal. And so that's really the problem. It looks as if God is omniscient, God has foreknowledge of everything that will happen, but if that's true, then everything that happens is already determined, it must happen of necessity, but then there's no role for free choice. And his mission is to show that's not right, that human freedom is compatible with the divine foreknowledge. So, he basically says, look, if something is going to occur freely, then God, who foresees all that shall be, foreknows this very fact, and whatever God foreknows shall necessarily happen in the way in which it is foreknown, so it is necessary that it shall happen free, and there is therefore no conflict whatever between a foreknowledge, which entails a necessary occurrence, and a free exercise of an uncoerced will. Now, he has much more to say about this problem, but that's the key to a solution. Yeah? Very important. He goes on to say that um, some things are predetermined, such as uh, such a predetermination of free will. And it's a throwback to Augustine's Day of God, Book 5, in which uh, Augustine takes a stand by Cicero that says it's a fixed order to the universe, and that everything is, that everything is fixed to the stars and such. Um, and um, then he, uh, Augustine, says, okay, then if we have free will, and God ordained that free will in fixed order, so he couldn't then cause individual humans to violate free will, because that would violate the own fixed order that he's already ordained. Ah, okay, yes. Notice that, and right, that, that's a, a nice sort of way of putting the point, which is it, it's sort of the, the move he makes here at the beginning. If we think about a sentence that doesn't involve human free will, something like, it's raining today, right? We can say, well, it was true yesterday that it would rain the next day. And that seems correct. Now, God knew then yesterday that it would rain today. So it's in some sense necessary that it rained today. Uh, there's, in a way, you can say, well, there's no reason to object to that, since presumably God or ordains this entire fixed system of things, and perhaps it's necessary as a result of physical law that reigns today. Right? <coughs> almost all of you are like wearing jackets and stuff. I'm not even getting a medal. I'm just thinking like this. <laughs> I, I, see, the disadvantage of philosophy. I walk out my door, I think, wow, it's cold today. But then I think, but wait, 
My senses have often deceived me in the past. Descartes has taught me never to trust anything that has once deceived me. So I must be mistaken. It's not really cold. <laughs> so I get in my car and I realize I'm crap. So anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but if, with this cramp the case, all right, it's a cold front move through, it's sunny today, it's raining today, that could be forwarding this to a problem. But what about free choice? Like the free choice of my walking out, noticing it's cold, and deciding, ah, I'm not going to go back inside and get a jacket. Surely I'm mistaken. <laughs> That's something that was an act of my own free will. And so, was that preordained? Now, one way of looking at this is to say, no, somehow it wasn't, okay? It's in a different category. Another way is to say, my choice was foreordained, but as a free choice. And so Anselm says, look, in some sense, yes, uh, because God has established a system of natural law, certain things are bound to happen. Because God has established a system of free choice, certain free choices are bound to take place. And that means, notice, not just that the person will choose a certain thing, but they will choose it free. So we have to understand in what sense freedom is compatible with that sense of prior determination. Now, here's an argument to Kant. And so let's call this the sort of incompatibility argument. Uh, what do I mean incompatibility? Well, incompatibility of divine foreknowledge and human freedom. The argument here is meant to show that we can't be free if God, in fact, knows everything before that. So, take some truth, like I didn't wear a jacket today, and say, all right. Um, it's true now, right, that I chose not to wear a jacket. Um, God, yesterday, already believed that. God's on mission, and so it must be that yesterday, God believed, then whatever this truth is, I'll just say T, okay, for this truth, but take as an example, I didn't wear a jacket. Okay? So yesterday, God being on mission already knew that I would, and in particular already believed that I would not wear a jacket today. But now, yeah, the past is necessary. So that premise says, look, if something happened, it's necessary that it happened. You can't change the past. And so the idea is, yeah, let's see, what did I do yesterday? I, yeah, I went to my bass guitar class, okay? Well, today, I can't change that. I did go to the bass guitar class. I was tempted. Someone invited me out to margaritas, but I said, no, I must study the bass guitar, <laughs> okay? And so I actually overcame the potential weakness of will, showed myself strong of will, went to class, and. Didn't much. But anyhow, the thought was, you know, yeah, um, the past is necessary. I can't change it. I can't decide, oh, that class was actually worthless. I wish I could go out for margaritas. I'll change the past so that I go out for margaritas. Too late, okay? The past is necessary. Now, what follows from that? Well, it is now necessary. believed T yesterday. <laughs> From yesterday, God believed that I would not wear a jacket today. And the past is necessary, so it's now necessary that God believed yesterday that I wouldn't wear a jacket today. But now, well, God is on mission. So if God believed <laughs> or believes T, then T. Okay, whatever God believes is true. God doesn't have any false beliefs. Yeah, so, five. <laughs> if P is now necessary, and if P, then Q, Then Q is now necessary. So the consequences of the necessary are themselves necessary. So it is now necessary that T. Ooh, but now we've got to the consequence that it's now 
necessary that I can prepare chapters. Yes? Um, I think one of the things that's um, argument to students is that class is the same mode as you do, but it's like linearly, and um, Bodhi is uh, yes. Because he doesn't say that, well, he thinks that phrases like prior determination or um, like God knows before are misguided because God doesn't see before and he sees above. And he has this like, metaphor between um, sight and touch that explains how um, God might dwell in the eternal presence. So he did, and C.S. Lewis, um, he, this idea is in the back of, or at the end of um, Great Force. So um, it's kind of a simple solution, but I think just a simple change in like framework is interesting because it because like this argument doesn't really recognize our simple limitations. Right. And we're not going off topic. Okay, good. Let's talk about potential solutions as we go, rather than having me sort of complete the argument. You can already see kind of where it's going, but good. There's some. No, that's all. That's fine. That's great. There are several things that you. There are several places on, in this argument where you might get off the boat, as it were. You might say, no, wait, stop, something's gone wrong. And what are some of those places? Actually, you might think that the first place to get off the boat is with just number one. <laughs> um, why? Well, you could say, look, um, yesterday God believed that today I would wear a jacket. Um, God doesn't believe things in time. It's not like God's sitting around watching the world unfold. You know, yesterday he just thought, ha, ah, that Bonnebach there, we've been teaching this course where he's talking a lot about me, get you along or wrong. And, and you know, that idiot is going to not realize it gets cold tomorrow and he's not going to wear a jacket. And so, uh, uh, right? That's one image of God. But you might think, no, that's not the right image of God. God isn't believing things in time. And so, indeed, one solution here is the solution identified with Boethius. And a number of other people have argued for this. Uh, I think Augustine already has this solution in his image of God on the mountaintop, seeing the sort of road of time all at once. But the idea is really, yes, um, one way to put it is to say, God is outside of time. Now, you don't have to put it quite as strongly as that. But what you do have to say is, God's beliefs <laughs> are somehow eternal, okay? And that's, a, you could say, well, you mean at every point in time? No, God's really outside of time. God is standing there surveying things at once and knows everything immediately. So to say God knows what will happen, well, yes, because God's surveying the entire stretch of time all at once immediately, but that's not to say that God is, God, God's sort of forming beliefs in time. God isn't in the temporal order, so there's something wrong right at the beginning. Yeah. Right, right, good. If yeah, if I say, you know, yesterday I I thought that I could generalize this argument and blah blah blah. Okay, yesterday that thought occurred to me. But if I say, you know, yesterday two plus two equal four, uh, there's something slightly odd about that, right? Now it's not exactly that well, yesterday no two plus two wasn't four, of course it was, but two plus two being four is something that exists eternally. It's not something that happened yesterday. Uh, and so God's Belief might be like that. Now you could say, well, look, that doesn't solve the problem if I can say God believes it eternally. I mean, that means at every single point in time it's true, which somebody could say maybe well, two plus two is four. Um, you say, no, 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 look, it's it's not like that. <laughs> um, God believes these things. Yeah, actually, Alexander Cruz has a nice term for this. I'm trying to remember what it is. Co-eternally? How does he put it? Um, it's sort of like, yes, uh, it, Standing outside of time in this way that's not just to be reduced to at every point in time, this is true, but something that encompasses all of time, but from the outside. And so, from that point of view, God's beliefs aren't the kinds of things that happened yesterday or today, they're the kinds of things that are outside. So, you look at one, you're going to say, that's not even well formed. You can't say yesterday God believed T. It's, it's not yesterday God didn't believe T or believe God T or something. It's rather just that God's beliefs stand outside. 
Okay, so that's one response. Can you think of other responses? There's a closely related response, actually, in Aristotle, which is that there's something. Here's why God didn't believe T yesterday. It wasn't true yesterday that T, because T had to do with the future. And so Aristotle says that basically future propositions, propositions about the future, have no truth value. His example, which is in De Interpretatione, is about a sea battle. He says, will there be a sea battle tomorrow or not? Well, the proposition that there will be a sea battle tomorrow, he says, is not even true or false. If it were already true or false, that it would be, there would be a sea battle tomorrow, he says it would be determined. And yet it's not determined. It's a contingent matter whether or not there's a sea battle tomorrow. And so, he says, it cannot therefore be true now, or else it would already be fixed that there will be a sea battle. It can't be false now, otherwise it would already be fixed that there will not, since it's not fixed. Therefore, the proposition that there will be a sea battle tomorrow is neither true nor false. And so that way, what he thinks is, well, God is omniscient and that God knows every truth. But T yesterday wasn't even true. It had no truth now. It wasn't true, it wasn't false. And so, of course, God didn't know it. That can sound like a denial of omniscience, but it only denies omniscience if there's a truth that God does not know. If there's no truth to know, then there's no problem. Yeah? Um, the, another solution is to, is to ask you. And that sounds like this. Ah, good, too. Yes, the past is necessary. Because he goes, look, it was necessary that something happened in the past. It's already happened. Right. Whereas if the present or the future is seen by this omniscient being who knows all, because it hasn't occurred yet, there's a type of necessity that if it didn't occur, he would be wrong and it's impossible to Right. Good. Okay. Yes. This is a solution that is usually associated with William of Ockham. But you're absolutely right. It's already in Anselm. Um, in fact, Anselm gets too little credit about all of this just because he tosses out many of these different solutions. And instead of devoting the entire work to defending one of them, which would identify his name with it, instead he tosses out a lot of ideas and then moves on to another idea. And so people just sort of say, oh, yeah, this is Ockham's solution. Well, really, it's Anselm's solution that Ockham picks up. It's one of Anselm's solutions. Anyway, it's to say, hold on a second, deny to, okay? So is the past necessary? The way this goes in Occam, at least, is to distinguish the hard past <laughs> from the soft past. Now, what does that mean? Well, there are hard facts about the past that indeed are necessary and cannot change. So I got a PhD in philosophy. Can't change that now. That's something that I did, that's part of the hard past. It happened, it was an event that occurred in the past, and so there it is. But somebody believing yesterday that something would happen today, that business about it being something that would happen today, that's you might say the soft past, because it's a fact about the past that had to do with the future. If I turn back and say, yes, I got my PhD actually in 1980. So let's see, what was future from the point of view of 1980? Let's see, it's true what I got my PhD. What? Oh, I was um, say they just all the same. The following wall. Oh, excellent, good. So, yes, it was true what I got my PhD that within a decade the Berlin Wall would fall. Okay? But was that a hard fact about the past in 1980? Well, no, it was already true. And so I can still back and say, wow, in fact, a year ago, in 1979, yes, it was just a decade until, it would, until the Berlin Wall would fall. But now, that's not a hard fact about 1979, right? That's something that was still open. You might say, look, it's not necessary because in 1979, it's just true that a decade later, the Berlin Wall is going to fall. Why am I doing this? This makes sense to me. It doesn't make sense to you. I should be reversing my hands and making the future go this way. Um, but yes, already in 1979, it was true that 10 years later, the Berlin Wall would fall. But is that a hard fact about 1979? No. And so it's not something that you might say, uh, once that's true about 1979, you might say, well, gosh, now it's determined that this is going to happen. No, because nobody knows it's true, right? In 1979, you might say, it's really not an epistemic matter. I'm misleading by putting it this way. But I think it's easy to see the point. That, look, in 1979, nobody knows this. Maybe God knows it. 
but there's nothing else I can say that fixes it. It's going to depend on people's free choices. And so there's something about the hard past. Certain things happened in 1979, like the invasion of Afghanistan. Well, there it is. It's part of a hard past already in 1980. But that 10 years later, the Berlin Wall would fall. That's something that's part of a soft past. It's true about 1979, but from a point of view of 1980, it's something that hasn't yet been determined. And so you might say, the past is just these things about the past are necessary. These aren't. They depend on what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Is that argument saying that there is a hard and soft past for God to live? Yes, yes. <clears throat> and, and so with all these solutions, um, there's a lot of dis discussion, a lot of literature about whether they work or not. And here, indeed, one of the things you might say is, well, I, I get this distinction from our point of view, but look, we're talking about God. In fact, when I put it epistemically, I said, right, in 1979, nobody knew that 10 years later the Berlin Wall was going to fall. Uh, God knew, right? So why isn't everything in fact a hard pass from God's point of view? Um, answer would have to be, well, because that future depends on human free choices. It's not already fixed in the sense in which it might be fixed that there will be an earthquake later, or just follows from physical laws. No, it depends on people's free choices. Yeah? Um, I have a question about like, sin. So how could, like, why would an admission God, if there was no free will, why would an, like a good omission God create an individual he knew was going to suffer and like force to sin, so is it like that would sin be like a factor for free will then like Ooh. all right good yes um so far we've been discussing this as if it's all sort of in a moral vacuum but as you point out this isn't in a moral vacuum at all why are we talking about this well because free will makes a difference people sometimes do good things freely sometimes bad things freely or at least so the advocate of free will says but now if you think, wait, God has foreknowledge of all of this, that means if that necessitates everything, then God is necessitating that person sinning and the suffering that results from that. The suffering for other people, maybe, the suffering for that person within this life, if that person is condemned to hell from the suffering after this life. And so uh, if the argument succeeds, you might say, whoa, gosh, now God is really responsible for all the evil. Okay, God creates you fully knowing that you will sin and that you will be condemned. And so God is actually, well, it's already necessary that this will happen. For one thing, it doesn't depend on you. So you can say, how is it just to condemn you if it was already determined you would do that? But moreover, you know, God creates you knowing full well you'll do that. And so, yeah, if this argument works, it feels like it shifts a lot of the moral responsibility from people to God. <laughs> yeah. Um, anticipating this, and so differentiates two types of necessity. Necessity, necessity. So basically a type of non-moral necessity, just like, because if he's omniscient, it necessarily happens as a proof of his omniscience, not necessarily, or not in a sense that he wants or forces you into that decision. It's, right. kind of, it's a necessity that it will happen, not that it must happen. So that's the difference. Ah, yes. Yeah, when he's describing this, he says, look, here's, here's what you should think about historical necessity. That it's necessarily true that if it happened, it happened. Not that if it happened, that it's necessary to happen. Okay? Um, he, it's a, I mean, something that a lot of religion would capture in terms of the scope this, this, this distinction. It's necessarily true that if it happens, it happens. Yes. But don't think if it happens then, it's necessary to happen. That's a different thing. Now, why does he draw that distinction? Well, in part because, and this is something that Anselm was in no position, and maybe we are still in no position to really fully sort out. This question of historical necessity is something that you might think you could object to for other reasons. And so we could just draw the distinction between the hard past and the soft past. We can also wonder whether the sense of necessity here actually ultimately makes any sense. Hans Kamp was writing a long paper on the logic of historical necessity, and it never ended up appearing uh, in publication. There was a mistake in it that he never went back and fully fixed. I've got the heart without the mistake, and it circulated informally for a long time back in the 70s. But it turns out to be very hard to sort out the logic of historical necessity. Why is it hard to sort out? Well, partly because you might think 
Actually, it's not a very well-defined idea. And there's now a large literature on trying to sort it out in the context of this argument. But that's a response. It's not exactly an Occam, but I'll put it as a sort of variant of this. Um, yeah, does historical necessity actually make sense? Is it really a kind of necessity? And one might worry that it really doesn't. That there's some sense in which, well, yeah, if something's already happened, then you can't change it. But on the other hand, that's the case, given our ordinary way of thinking about things, is that the case with respect to God's foreknowledge? I mean, what if instead of God's knowledge requiring me to do this, it's my free choice to do to leave my jacket at home, for example, that makes God foreknowledge? That would be a kind of reverse causation, a sort of backwards causation, right? God knows, either in time, yesterday, or outside of time, that I will leave my jacket at home because at this time, I actually make the choice freely to leave my jacket at home. And so the causal arrow actually I think goes this way. In which case, this idea of necessity is somehow screwed up. Um, yes, I can't change a hard fact about the past once it's happened, but on the other hand, this is kind of a strange sort of thing. One thing that happens with respect to soft facts is that that sort of backward causation seems possible. Uh, let's say, to think about the theological context, that I'm an excellent fortune teller. In fact, I'm a brilliant fortune teller. I am it's almost always right. And so I look at Lexi, for example, and I think, uh, let me think. I'm studying my crystal ball. Tomorrow you will wear something blue. Okay. Now, I don't I, I have no idea. I picked out blue because it seemed to me more likely than any other color. <laughs> but suppose I really did have this vision, right? I see it, I see it. Ah, oh, I see you tomorrow. There you are, you know, sitting in the library, studying philosophy, <laughs> of course, and wearing blue. Now, does that determine what she's going to do? Well, no, it's, if I'm really a good fortune teller, it's that somehow I can see the future. And it's that fact about the future that's causing me then to have this state of mind, right? And so we're, it's her sitting in the library wearing blue that causes me to have this vision, that then causes me to say that, come to know this. And so the causation actually works from the future to the past. Now, part of the reason we think this fortune telling idea doesn't make much sense is we don't think people have the ability to be caused by things in the future in that sort of way. But God does preserve it. God's knowledge is such that God's state of mind, in time or outside of time, is caused by people's free choices, at least if we think these things are compatible. So for God, that sort of backwards causation makes sense. But if that makes sense, then in what sense is the past really necessary? Maybe there's something about that notion of historical necessity that is fundamentally different in the way it relates to causation, the way it relates to states of mind, and so on, than other senses of necessity. So maybe there's something very fishy about this whole idea. And that would be a way of exploiting this. You might say, two is true only with respect to the hard past, not with respect to the soft past that's in the future. Or you could just say, I'm actually doubtful about this whole idea of historical necessity. I don't get it. I know what it means for something to be necessary and contingent in a logical sense, in a physical sense. I don't get it about this, the past business. I don't think it's the same concept. I don't think it makes much sense. OK. Well, are there other things we can object to? Let's see, this just follows from one and two. If God believed in that T, well, that's just God's omniscience. You could deny omniscience, but if we want to stay with the classical conception of God, we don't want to do that. Uh, what about this idea? If something's necessary and then something follows from it, then it's necessary. Could we deny that? Could we deny the consequences uh, of the necessity, of the necessary being necessary? Well, maybe, but now, let me continue the argument and we'll see how it can go. Okay, it's now necessary that I beat my job in, according to this. Well, the argument proceeds that, if so, <laughs> then it is impossible For, well, in this case, me to do otherwise. Um, it's impossible. Let me see. Yeah. 
to do otherwise than to make t true. But now, if I can't do otherwise, I have no freedom. This is called the principle of alternative possibilities. Which is to say, I must have alternative possibilities in order to be free. I'm not going to get free choice if there were no alternative possibilities that might have come about. So, the conclusion to all of that is, I have no freedom. Specifically with respect to T. Of course, but T was an arbitrary fact, so we've really shown this in general. Yeah? Um, then the kind of solution that the very philosophers propose is called the middle model. And I don't know exactly how it works, but it's like all, all these possible worlds exist where, could, where all the different choices. Ah, okay, yes. There are two main other solutions that I want to mention. Of course, you don't have to solve this problem. You can just say, aha, so there is no freedom. <laughs> okay, so one response to this is to just be a determinist. And so we should put here, I'll put this as solution zero, since in a sense it's like, yeah, um, determinism. To say, yeah, are you right? We have no freedom. And indeed, that's what Luther and Calvin do. Okay? Lots of other Protestants don't, but they themselves do. They offer determinism. Uh, and so that's one way of going. But yes, there is a solution that is known as the Mullinist solution. After De Molina, <laughs> okay, a 16th century thinker, and it, it proceeds in terms of God's middle knowledge. Now, what is middle knowledge? Well, it is the knowledge of what you would do under various circumstances. So, God is thinking about creating the world. Okay, and so God looks and says, well, all right, maybe I'll put you in this world. What would you do under various circumstances? And God thinks, okay, in this situation, you would do, now you would do, you would freely choose this. So, presumably these choices aren't determined by me, you would be free with respect to them, but you would make a choice and God knows what choice you would make. Yeah. This is much older than this is the book of Job, this is the problem of the evil. Because, yes, which is absolutely. Because um, Satan, the accuser, is before the hand of the court, and he says, You haven't given him anything but blessings, so he doesn't have a choice but to praise you, because he hasn't felt otherwise. Why would he curse you if he were? If you were completely blessed by him, he knows nothing else. Oh, and right. so God says, but, aha, I know that he is so good that even if you do anything you want to do, oh, uh, nice he will. <laughs> no, right, that he'll still. So, yeah, God basically claims that kind of middle love. He says, no, I know that God, that Job, even if tested, um, would still remain faithful. Okay, and so what God is claiming is that kind of middle knowledge. Notice God is not saying there, I have already fixed it, so that God will, so the job, Job will do this. Instead, God is saying, no, I know that Job will freely choose to remain faithful, to me, even if everything goes away. So, right, the middle knowledge itself is counterfactuals. If you were <laughs> in circumstance C, you would freely. Uh, 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 uh. There's a sense in which this solution is already there to answer because he says, look, necessity is compatible with my free choice. So the thought is, God can know that. God can know these con conditionals, these counterfactuals, if you were in circumstance C, that you would freely perform action A. And when God creates the world, God can create a world knowing fully well what you will freely choose. But that's not incompatible with your free choice. That's something that, in fact, has to do with what you would choose. So, in a certain sense, when God creates that world, it's already fixed that it will be a world where you do such and such. But it's because God knows those counterfactuals. 
So one question is, what exactly in this argument does that force us, us to give up? What is all of this challenge? Um, there are, I guess, different ways of developing it. One it, way of looking at it is that it's challenging this to the past is necessary. It's a way of saying, no, uh, look, it's, it's that God has this special kind of knowledge, and so it is true in the past that God knows that if I were in circumstances, see, I will do this, and so may know that this is a world I'm creating where you will be in circumstance, see, and so you will freely choose to do this, but nevertheless, it's still a free choice. It is not thereby determined. So that way of looking at it would deny two. Another way to look at it is that it denies eight. Maybe it's already fixed, but that doesn't mean I have no freedom. I can freely choose that. And indeed, that is another solution. And now I'm running out of track towards space. So where can I write this? It also strikes down seven now, because the necessity of the necessity oh, yeah. No, because it, it is possible to do otherwise, but God knows that you won't, and so there's that historical that's exactly right. You could say, wait, no, no, no. It's, it's still possible for me to do otherwise. It's a free choice. It may be that I will do this, that God knows I will do this. Nevertheless, it has nothing to do with uh, it is possible. It is possible. Well, since I've run out of space for further solutions down here, let me write solution 5 up here. It is one sometimes is affiliated with Augustine. And it is to deny the principle of alternative possibilities. So it's to deny eight. Now, the person on the contemporary scene who's most affiliated with this attempt to deny the principle of alternative possibilities is Ferry Franker. Uh, and he has a number of cases, uh, the most dramatic of which involves an assassination. Um, I must say, what was this guy to assassinate someone? I'd like to you know, perform the assassination, but I don't want to be guilty of it. I want to get away with it. Um, and so I basically, I know he's sympathetic to the cause, uh, and so, and yet I know he's not as worried the cause as I am. So I'm a little worried about it. Maybe he'll chicken out again, yeah. maybe he'll get a moral conscience and won't assassinate the person, or whatever. So I put a chip in his brain, and I can radioactivate it. Basically, the chip will tell me whether he is inclined to, to actually assassinate the person, and if he doesn't, it will trigger and <coughs> force him to assassinate the person. Okay? Now, as it happens, things are going along. I'm monitoring his brain condition on my computer screen. I'm there ready to press the button to get the chip to activate to, to get him to go through with the assassination. But instead, he actually goes through. He freely chooses. Okay? Now, it seems like this is a case where he did freely choose to, to actually assassinate the person. He actually goes through with it. He pulls the trigger. He does all that freely. The chip in his brain never activates. On the other hand, could he have done otherwise? No, because if he had decided check it out, I would have triggered that and that would have made him decide to do it, okay? So the thought is, yeah, in this kind of case, you couldn't have done otherwise, nevertheless, you did do it free. Okay? Now, by the way, part of the reason I, I'm entertained by this example, this isn't entertaining, this is horribly impressive, but um, you know about the assassination that started World War I. Um, yeah, the uh, assassination of the Archduke Francis Ferdinand. Um, there were six people from the Black Hand, the Serbian radical organization, who were to take part in that assassination. Uh, until it got to Gavrilo Princip, um, all of them chickened out. One threw a grenade in the car, but the Archduke actually was quite athletic, leaped up and whacked the grenade in the crowd. <laughs> uh, where it blew up in the his mother gave him all but he was okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, like, actually, I'm saying in the crowd, really. It, I mean, it, he battled it away from the car. It, it wasn't like right into a bunch of school children or anything. Um, and nobody died as a result of that. One person was injured from travel. But part of it was like, okay, in fact, at that point, some officials said, we better call off this parade. And he said, oh, come on. Surely they can't do this more than once in a day. <laughs> okay, well, in fact, that was the first of six assassins. Then, assassin number two, assassin number three, assassin number four, assassin number five, all gets to the point of, okay, there's the archduke, and the chicken out. Okay? But, after, at some point, they decide, look, we've got to change the parade route. 
uh, just in case there are any further assassins. So they decide to change this. But the driver takes a wrong turn and follows the original parade route instead of the revised parade route. Uh, he realizes his mistake. He stops the car. He stops the car right in front of Gabriel Prince, who apparently was like on the borderline of checking it out. It's like he's right there, and the car is stopped. So he pulls out his gun and fires and kills the Archduke. <laughs> but that was the result of, you know, six assassins, four chicken outs, just as in the Frankfurt case. There was nobody there with the chip to make him do it. One didn't get close enough and just lobbed his grenade, and so Princip was the only one who actually did it. So, uh, anyway, yeah, that, that was just my bit of irrelevant historical knowledge, too. Uh, but, you know, could he have been in a situation that he have alternative possibilities? Well, surely, yes. But if he had this Frankfurt like chip in his brain, the answer would be no, he actually had to do it. And yet, if the chip never activated, he would have. So, you might say, well, if God has already decided, that, yes, I will do this. I decided. I God believed this. Um, well, believes it because of my own free choice. It may be that given that God's belief is fixed, there is no way of life. This is the future we're on, right? I'm going to choose that. There is no longer any possibility of my doing otherwise. On the other hand, I still do it freely. And so the thought would be, actually, I can grant that it's already fixed that I will do this, but nevertheless, I'm doing it freely. It's fixity doesn't come from my freedom. Um, now, I think Anselm's idea is really these work best in combination. It's best not to just choose one of these solutions. But for example, if you say that, all right, suppose it is in some sense fixed already. Nevertheless, that doesn't mean I'm not acting freely. Maybe God's knowledge is that this is the future that will take place. And here's the final thought. Anselm, I think, at one point, flirts with this idea and mentions it briefly. But it's, a, it's something that actually I think is an important thing to notice about this whole argument. This is really a version of what was called in ancient times the master argument, put forward by the Stoic thinker Diodorus. Um, and it was meant to show that you have no freedom based purely on truths about the future. Okay, so get God out of this. Just replace God with the truth. Yesterday, it was already true that today, I would not wear my jacket. But the past is necessary. So it's now necessary that yesterday was true, blah, 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 blah. But wait, if, <clears throat> if yesterday was true that today this would happen, then today this would happen. That's what it means for it to be true, but blah, 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 blah. So it's now necessary to T, so it's impossible for me to do otherwise. In other words, God and God's omniscience have nothing essential to do with the argument. It's really an argument about the past and the future, and the idea that if it's already, if future tense propositions can be true, then in the past, a future tense proposition could already be true, that depends for its truth, you might say, on something happening in the future. Well, does its having been true in the past mean because of the necessity of the past that it's already fixed in the future? There's nothing here that actually has anything to do with God, or God's creation, or God's omniscience, essentially at all. So if that's right, you might say, this isn't actually a challenge to God's omniscience or foreknowledge or anything like that. This is really about the relationship between the past and the future and whether the fixity of the past somehow fixes the future. But intuitively, it seems like, well, that's crazy, <laughs> right? But if that's right, then look, this essentially has nothing to do with one's concept of God. It really has to do with getting the relationship between past and future straight. All right, well, next time we really will be in Aquinas. But since many of the thinkers we'll be looking at bounce off this argument and respond to one way or another, this is a good thing for us to